You're listening to the Revision Path Podcast, a weekly showcase of the world's black graphic designers, web designers, and web developers. Through in-depth interviews, you'll learn about their work, their goals, and what inspires them as creative individuals. Here's your host, Maurice Cherry. Welcome once again to the Revision Path Podcast. I'm Maurice Cherry, and we've got a great show today talking with Akila Tompkins Robinson, an e-commerce coach and a WordPress designer. But before we get into that, let's thank our lovely sponsors, MailChimp and Audible. MailChimp makes email marketing super simple. I have a small business myself, and I use MailChimp to send campaigns, send autoresponders, check reports. I really don't know where my business would be without it. Uh, sign up for free today at MailChimp.com. If you're just starting out with email marketing, then MailChimp is definitely the way to go. Speaking of free, head on over to audibletrial.com forward slash revision path and get a free 30 day trial and choose a free audiobook from their 150,000 book library. Last week I was reading Walter Mosley's uh, Debbie Doesn't Do It Anymore. This week, who knows? I can browse their library and find something, and so can you. It's great if you have a Kindle. Um, I have the Kindle Paperwhite, it's great for finding uh, audiobooks on there. Uh, just hit up audibletrial.com forward slash revision path and cop that free 30 day trial and audiobook. Now let's get into this week's interview with Akila Tompkins Robinson. Here we go. Okay, so tell us who you are and what you do. My name is Akila Tompkins Robinson. I am a web designer and an e commerce strategy coach. And what I do is, of course, I design beautiful websites, but I mostly focus on designing websites that work and looking at the conversion rates and SEO, social media, everything that goes around your website. And for my e-commerce, everything that goes around just building an e-commerce store and getting the right products and getting the right target market and making sure that the business is really a viable business. So when you get that beautiful website, it actually does what you want it to do, which is to make money. How did you decide to specialize in doing e-commerce sites? Kind of interesting. Well, I like e-commerce. I like sites with functionality. I know some people shy away from an actual functional site because it's a lot of work, but I actually like functionality. So I like, you know, e-commerce, appointment setup. So anything that I've really got to dig in there and do some type of setup and code, I like that. And then, of course, I, well, not of course, but I like shopping. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's kind of cliche that I'm their customer, but I do online shopping a lot because I like to shop and I see a lot of what I like and what I don't like. And not necessarily, I mean, of course, you know, Macy's looks good and Nordstrom's looks great, those type of sites. But when you start looking at little boutiques to follow, I get, I'm very, the designer me is a little bit critical, <laughs> I guess. So, you know, I'll see sites that are like, wow, I wish this was a, they have nice products, but they don't look like I should give them my credit card information or I'm not even sure if it might even get shipped to me or they have nice products, but they look like it was built in 92, that type of thing. Or, you know, they could have had better description or it was hard to find. I just meet so many people that want to do some type of online store and they have great ideas that they, once they get to the rest of it, they're just like throwing it together or they're using something like big cartel or big commerce and not realizing how that's hurting their sales as much as they think it's helping their sales and, or there are Instagram stores. Oh, they kill me. <laughs> um, so, you know, there are Instagram stores where all they're doing is putting up stock photos with their name across it. Mm -hmm. So I see all of these infractions just out there in the world of my day to day shopping. And I wanted to start helping people. And so I started, I already have my web design business. I do, you know, primarily e-commerce customers. And then I started an information site, which that started a little bit as a experiment because I was also doing Pat Flynn's niche site duel at the same time. And I found some good keywords that were right around the space that I love. So that was kind of a godsend for me. And just started getting all this information together and gathering things and talking to people and learning that there really was a need for people to be able to build really, really good online e-commerce sites. So that's okay. me. That's how I started. So let's say someone is looking to start out with an e-commerce site. And we're not talking about like the Instagram store like you're mentioning, but they have an idea in mind. How would you approach a new project like that if someone came to you with an idea for a store? The first thing I do is talk about their target market and finding a niche. 
from my training with, with, you know, following Pat Flynn and a bunch of other niche marketers, I'm really into like finding that good keyword, finding a market that's really going to sell, finding some place where you won't have to work as hard to get traffic because people are actually looking for you. So for example, I had someone come to me a couple months ago who wanted to do very, like not going to say normal, but pretty much what everyone's doing. They wanted to do really trendy clothes and really kind of the what whatever's hap- happening type clothing stuff right now. Mm-hmm. And when I looked at their line, I saw that they also did a really a lot of really nice bathing suits. Very trendy bathing suits, but you know, nice bathing suits, some of them going back to like the 60s, 70s, a little play on bathing suits that they're doing now. And I told her, instead of trying to do everything, so instead of trying to do dresses, shorts, pants, t-shirts, and everything, you've got a really nice niche here of bathing suits. So you can integrate some of those other things, even integrate like the accessories and the jewelry because you know now people want to swim with earrings on. Um, so you want to you can integrate all those things, but you can really play off the fact that you do like a summer fun swimwear. And I, she was located in Atlanta, so you know it's fun summer down there half the time. So you know it really worked for her. And so that's my first thing I do is looking at what you want to sell and looking at who you want to sell to is try to get them into some type of niche. So whether if they want to do dresses, looking at their inventory, are you more of a party dress or more of a prom dress? Are you doing more wedding dresses? But finding something that we can utilize to kind of hone it down just a, t- a tiny bit more to really find a market. Because no matter what kind of site you put up, no matter how great your products are, if you don't have a really good market and if your market's too broad, you're going to have a really difficult time. Okay. So that's my first thing is let's, let's find that market. Let's find where you can kind of, kind of carve out something and build from there. Are there any e-commerce platforms that you prefer to work with that you think are better for people that are just starting out? Well, I'm a WordPress developer. So okay. and being a web designer, I do WordPress. I've spoken a couple of work camps. I'm really into the WordPress community. So I always recommend WordPress. And I tell people up front that, yes, WordPress is a little bit harder to get started, but it's so worth it. And a couple of reasons why is you're not paying, like, monthly fees or fees per product. Both some of the hosted platforms like Big Commerce, Big Car- Cartel, Shopify, a bunch of them that I do talk about on my site. Like, I give honest reviews of them. Mm-hmm. but. They also charge monthly fees. They Some of them limit or make you pay per the amount of items that you have. So if you have 50, the minute you get 51, now you're in another payment tier and you're paying that monthly. They also have terms of service. I've heard horror stories about people on various sites that got pretty much taken off the site or their shop got closed down or they lost everything within minutes because of some arbitrary terms of service that people very rarely read. And then when something like that, because they're on a dedicated platform and they don't have their own backups, once you lose it, you lose it. It's kind of gone. I've even known, um, gotten a couple of people who did something like Vista Print. Like, okay, great, I got Vista Print. They did the right thing of getting their own domain name so they didn't have the, you know, something vistaprint.com. But then when they wanted to move in less than a year, Vista Print kept their domain name and was holding it for hostage. So they had to change the whole name oh, wow. of their store. So there's so many horror stories with dealing with some of those platforms that that's not, I never really steer anyone to that platform. Even in the beginning, I suggest kind of doing as much, even if you do like a training model instead of doing a hiring a full designer model or just a basic, this is just the theme type model. That's better because you have something to grow on. And, you know, later on, the good thing about WordPress is is you can put up just regular 2014 their basic theme. You can put that up now, and then in six months, once you make it start making a little bit of revenue, you can do a much more elaborate theme. And in a year, you can hire a designer to make everything exactly the way you want. And you never have to lose everything and start all over again. When a lot of these platforms, although they, some of them take custom code, it's never as customized as you want it to be. Right you think you want it to be. Plus, you can add on. So if your business grows into coaching, like my business grew from just web design into coaching, I now can add coaching stuff and appointments online and all of those other great things. I also have products. I go from just having a portfolio, and I also have products on my site. So I can do all of these things because I have a platform that I can grow on. So I try to get people to start there, even though it's a little bit more difficult. It may take a little bit more time. 
I know everything else is so much easier. <laughs> so that's what I tell people to do. The only time I say a hosted platform is if the person's a crafter. So, or any type of handmade goods, because that to me, you have to think of another thing of how much product are you actually going to produce mm-hmm. and how quickly and how frequently, how much you're going to have your price point. So if someone's a crafter and actually doing handmade items, I really like Etsy. I, and, I was thinking about Etsy. I know a lot of crafters sort of go there first. Yeah. And I don't like it because it's a marketplace and marketplaces. You have to deal with the competition. So somebody can come there and click on your purple scarf and now they find like five other purple scarves. Mm -hmm. And so you have to fight about that. But if you're a crafter, even if you're just a hobby crafter and you're only making like 10 items a month, Etsy might be a good place for you because you're not really producing a high volume. So until you're producing a high volume, I say Etsy is a good place. Etsy is a good place to get started. Actually, we have another coaching client who's really, really successful on Etsy and the only thing is I do like people to move off of Etsy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I'm working on that with her. But, you know, if you're starting out really, really small, if it's something that you can't mass produce or can't get a lot of, then a place like Etsy might be a good place for you. Okay. Let's talk about your speaking. You mentioned that you spoke at a few word camps. I know Word Camp Philly and Word Camp Baltimore. You've also got another, another word camp you're speaking at coming up. Is that right? Yep, I'm doing WordCamp Connecticut. Actually, I've probably already done it by the time you air this. WordCamp Connecticut is in May. Okay. All right. How'd you get started on the speaking circuit? Really? Just applying. You'd be surprised how, so any designers who listen to this, you'd be surprised how easy it is to apply. I started out, really, I started my first, wasn't even a speaking engagement. It was a Twitter chat, small biz lady, Melinda Emerson's Mm -hmm. uh, Twitter chat. And I just applied. I just put in my application. It asked for like some questions, what your topic is. And I was very, very shocked that I got accepted. (laughs) So I did the Twitter chat and that was great and that was fun. And then I just started going to, I went to my first work camp was New York work camp. I think it was 2012 or 2011. Word Camp NYC, actually the last one they had, they have one coming up in August. So if anybody's in NYC, I will i don't know if I'll be speaking, but I'll be there, <laughs> definitely attending. Right. But yes, yeah, so I just started applying to different Word Camps, applying to other local events. I've spoken at some of the colleges here. I've spoken at some of the professional groups here. People would see me speak and started kind of seeking me out. I also, to help build my speaking skills, I joined Toastmasters International. So that helped me to become a better speaker, at least I think a better speaker, a little bit more polished. And I just kind of just apply and just put myself out there. And don't be afraid to get the no, just fill out the application. And it's also good to have topics, too. So if you already have things like my speaking, I do one on boosting your business online, another topic on monetizing, where I talk a little bit about e-commerce and which sites, that type of thing. The one I've done at a couple of word camps, which is on social media and integrating social media with your WordPress. So if you already have things that you know that you talk about, those are good, too, because you can use that when you're applying and just tailor it to that audience. People like to know that you already have something prepared and they've already kind of seen what you do. Like I do social media with WordPress a lot because they saw me at Baltimore. The Baltimore saw me at Brooklyn. Connecticut wants me to do it because Brooklyn said that she's good at this. You know, so I know I'm talking about the same thing a lot, but it's what people have seen me do and they're really excited to hear me come talk to their audience. Well, I think that's interesting to mention that you, like you said, you already have sort of a few talks that you already know how to do. I think the perception might be for people that are starting out wanting to speak is that you have to talk about something different at every conference. Like every place that you speak, you have to talk about something different. You can't pull out the same talk, which from what you're telling me, that's not the case. You can recycle what you talk about. Just try. Yeah, I like I said, I do. I have my base ones that I do. So I definitely think that you can. Pull, not gonna say the same topic, but I make, I tell it to my audience. So, like the boosting your online presence, I did it a couple years ago at Stevens University and I was talking to college students. I talked more about their personal, not a business, but their personal presence and getting their resumes and things that'll boost their resumes, like guest posting different places so they can put that on their resume and people bring up their names. They bring up all the things that they've done, not just their kind of site that you put up. Everybody expects your billboard but they want to see all the sites that you put up. 
that's more for a personal and more was really great for, you know, the college academic arena. When I did it last year for an entrepreneur's expo, I switched it up a bit. I put in some parts because they actually already had someone talking about websites. So they asked me to take out that and talk more about Google Analytics, which I did that part. But I also talked about it more boosting your business's presence. So getting out there in groups more and how to market without being like a sleazy marketer and doing all kinds of things still with guest posting because that's kind of an underlying thing but the different ways to target how you're going to guest post who you're going to guest post with how to get your site recognized and get out there so i just talk about it from a different angle Mm -hmm. but it's still it's still essentially the same overall topic and for even for social media every time i do it i don't do them every week which is kind of good so every time i do it the social media scape has changed So as I'm preparing now for Connecticut, I've got a whole slide on all the Facebook pages and more on how to strategically promote posts that I didn't have before because it really wasn't as necessary when I did it last year in Baltimore. Mm -hmm. So, you know, every time I tweak it for my audience, I tweak it for what's going on during, you know, that certain time. It's just an overall topic that I'm pretty good at and that people want to hear and listen and learn about. Speaking of college, talk to us a little bit about, you went to Seton Hall, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about Seton Hall, sort of what you studied. Is that sort of where you got the idea to start your own business and to get into design? Well, yes, I guess. I I guess it is where I started. (laughs) Because I went to, well, I went to Seton Hall and then I got my master's at Stevens. But I went to Seton Hall for, I was a communication, I started as psych, but I became a communications major with a concentration in PR and advertising. So I've always been into the PR advertising marketing end of most things. Like I like to sell, but I like to sell visually. So I've always been into that. And I've always been into computers. So for most of my electives, instead of taking yoga or (laughs) all the other crazy electives that they had, I took things like web design and 3D Studio Max at the time and Photoshop and all these different things that helped me also to get a certificate in information technology. At the same time, I'm also in a sorority. I'm a member of Zeta Phi Beta sorority. And at that time, you know, we didn't have a website, so we needed a website. Doing flyers and things like that on campus was really important to have. We used to do parties at clubs and stuff like that, so we need to have really nice flyers. And, of course, we didn't have much of a budget. So I used everything that I learned in all these different classes to help even market my chapter on campus at the time. So it's really how I got started designing, but not really doing it as a business. I was really doing it kind of between class and hobby and, you know, just hanging out and playing with it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then because people would see what I did or they would have businesses, I started doing a couple of local businesses. Then I went to, I started working and then I went to Stevens. When I, at Stevens, my degree, I got a degree in information systems and started really working more in the IT world, which is where I really like learned more coding and got really more into IT and more just into technology and also learned a little bit more about making this actually a business. So I, really, I tell people like I started out kind of hobby to freelancer to business mm-hmm. because a lot of freelancers aren't really on the business side yet. You know, they're just kind of job to job. Some are. So if you're a freelancer, I'm not offending you. (laughs) But some I know, and I know I was one of them, hadn't crossed that threshold yet. It was just like a, you know, job to job to job. My contracts were kind of in the air, different for each person. I had a site, but it wasn't really targeted or really polished the way it should be to say, okay, I'm an actual business. And, you know, as I progressed with it, as I got more clients, as I found out what kind of sites I like to work on, as I got better educated from like business coaches, I've worked with a couple of coaches out there, I really learned that this is how you run a business and the business aspect of it. Started using more tools to help to manage clients, which is also how I got into WordPress because at that time I was doing it just HTML, XML, JavaScript, hard-coded sites. So I could never take on more, and I was working full-time too, so I could never take on more than 10 clients at a time. Mm -hmm. And so that's another reason that kept me kind of at that hobby freelance level because I couldn't scale it where I could take on a whole bunch of people without having some type of, you know, degradation of service, which nobody wants that. So once WordPress, I got started learning WordPress, and this is right around 2.9, 2.8, 
versions of WordPress okay. and I started learning how to really customize themes and go in there and dealing with the PHP and that type of thing. Then 3.0 and any WordPress developer who's been on WordPress that long ago, that 3.0 was like the epiphany. <laughs> it's like the epiphany version for all of us. Right. So, but then 3.0 made it easier to do things like separate pages and custom menus and really take it from being a blog to a site. So even if someone looks at my original resume site, you'll see that it's a hard-coded site with a blog attached. That's because it's pre-3.0. <laughs> it's like year, I think I did that back in 2008 or something like that. So it's really pre-2.0, I mean pre-3.0. And But 3.0 enabled me to put everything into a content management system, which made it much easier for me to take on more clients because it was easier for me to do updates as opposed to always having to go in there and change the code and tweak this here and that there, hope I don't break anything or forget a period somewhere. It made it easier for me to bring on staff, you know, to just say, okay, oh, I'm going to teach you how to update posts and pages, and you can help me do this when an issue comes in with a client. It even made it easier for me to train clients. Here's how you use a content management system. So that just really skyrocketed my freelance hobby into a business. Okay. All right. So tell me about, I guess, your, your childhood. Did you always have this kind of creative spark even when you were young? I've always liked to sell stuff. So I was one of those lemonade stand type kids okay. or paper rocks or whatever else I could try to sell you. <laughs> <laughs> like lots of yard sales. And I've always liked technology. My father was really into computers. Like we had a Commodore 64 and I'm probably dating myself, right? <laughs> um, but we had all that stuff. We had like a, he used to actually build computers. My first computers were all built by my dad. Oh, he nice. built computers and we were on BBS groups and stuff, AOL type stuff, like all kinds of crazy really archaic internet stuff, just DOS prompts. Like I knew DOS prompts at probably in my teens. <laughs> so, um, so he was really into that type of stuff. So I've always been into the technology and tinkering around with stuff. And then always liking to sell things, always like to draw, like to be creative, but I will tell you, and it's funny because last week I had a scrapbooking, I'm a scrapbook committee for my sorority. And they're thinking, well, you're a designer. You're going to be great at scrapbooking. I'm not. <laughs> I'm pretty horrible at it. And the reason why, when I explain it, is like I see all these great things in my head. I never could get them to come out of my hands. Never. So I can't draw but so well. I can, I've tried every craft in Michael's that I'm only mildly good at. But I can definitely make it happen digitally. So that's what really prompted my the whole thing with the flyers back in college. I couldn't draw a flyer or sketch out a flyer, but I could definitely make it happen in Photoshop. So that really, that really helped take my creativity that was in my head and helped me get it to something outside of my head. So okay. All right. That's, that's so what you, happened. So you talked about, I guess, scrapbooking. This is, you know, kind of, I guess, in your, in your downtime. Are there any personal projects that you're working on? Well, most of my problem, well, the scrapbooking was just for the committee. I don't scrapbook. Okay. Ever. Okay. <laughs> Which is why I told them, like, I just joined because, you know, I'm good at layout. I'm good at design. Right, right. I'm not really good at the cut and pasting and drawing. So that's just happened to be for that committee. And they were just a little shocked that I wasn't better at it. Most of my projects and hobbies are surrounded around websites. Like that's how online boutique source site came up is because I was following Pat Flynn and he's talking about the niche site duel. I started doing some research and I said, hey, you know, I, I build websites. I can build my own. So I built my own website. So those are my kind of hobby things, like building my own website or building some new piece to a site or building something. So not that, you know, okay. <laughs> not that exciting. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it, it sounds like that, you know, the web and even everything that you do with your business and marketing, that sort of takes up a lot of your time just in general. Mm -hmm. You talked about Pat Flynn. Are there any sort of, I guess, marketers in that arena that you also follow? Well, I follow Pat. I follow David Seitman Garland, social media examiner. I forgot his name just that quick. Some like Marie Forleo. I'm actually taking B school. Amy Porterfield's really good one. I, I listen to a lot of podcasts. So if you got a good podcast, I probably follow you. Uh, what's the other guy's name? Derek Halpern. He's really good. So almost all of the kind of internet marketers in some way, shape, or form, 
I follow them a little bit, which I think helps. I like it because I like all the information, but I think it also helps me when working with companies and working with businesses because a lot of those, they're talking about building some type of internet business. Mm -hmm. They don't really talk about how that crosses into like an e-commerce store, even a regular brick and mortar store that wants to get onto e-commerce and using some of those same techniques like the, some of the same things that I learned doing a niche site and how to get target that market, find those keywords, do your SEO. Those things I learned trying to build an, an internet marketer site can definitely be used in building an online boutique site and actually should be used in building an online boutique site. But a lot of people don't do that crossing and don't really marry the two together. And that's not going to say that's what makes their business fail, but it could be more successful. They're working really, really hard posting here, there, and everywhere when really they can just optimize their site so that they're just getting generic traffic from Google or wherever. And and with doing that optimizing, it's about sort of finding finding that niche where people will come to you as opposed to you having to market or really, I guess, do a lot of marketing. Is that right? Yeah, yeah definitely. I think the most important part of optimizing and just SEO period is finding the correct Keywords, terms, and just that niche. Because without doing much of anything else, like, of course, your H1 tags, you want all that stuff to be great. But without doing much of anything else, if you've got the right terms that people are really looking for, and not just generic terms, but, you know, people are looking for, but there's not a lot of competition out there, then your your business can almost run on its own. Do you have any mentors that have helped you out with all of this? Like, I guess, with growing your business and everything? Well, I've got a couple of being online and uh, being on Facebook. I've joined a couple of a couple of really really good groups. So I've worked with um, Ty Goodwin. She's actually one of the business coaches I've worked with, and I'm really good friends. And she's coached me a little bit. Um, Stephanie C. Harper. She runs the Career Magazine. Ty Goodwin's site is I think tygoodwin.com. Those are kind of my main two. I have other kind of business friends like Sadia, who we met through. She's one of like a business friend, more of a mastermind group like you know we can bounce ideas off of each other type mm -hmm. but those are two i kind of would say are kind of on this level that i want to you know that level where i want to be and you. trying to try to be like them <laughs> when where, i grow up where do you see your business going in the next like five years or so i really want it to be very holistic like i've talked a lot about all the different aspects so more than just designing the site, like I said before, but bringing in all these other elements to help people to really grow a sustainable business. All right. So let's get off of business now for just a, a little bit. If you okay. weren't doing the work that you're doing right now, like if you weren't building websites and talking to clients, and this might be a bit, this might be a hard question, but if you weren't doing all of this, what would you be doing? What are your other sort of passions that you have? If I wasn't doing this, I would probably be Shopping. Like my other passion, is, <laughs> not, no, no, not in a lofty sense, but my other passion has always been being like a buyer, like a Macy's buyer. Okay. <laughs> so not just shopping arbitrarily, spending money. No, but spending money to make money. I do like style and design and putting things together, even if it's not on the computer or drawing or anything like that, but even just in fashion in the world. So I like interior design. I like fashion design. I like makeup design. Mm -hmm. So, and I like the shop. So, you know, being a buyer, helping to source things, helping to find those like nuggets to put them together to make a whole look. I would still be doing something like that just in a different space. Okay. What are you excited about right now at the moment? Right now I'm excited about, e-commerce. I mean, very, I know, <laughs> <laughs> very, you know, cliches, if I say it one more time, but really fashion and just, there's a lot of good opportunity out there for people. I'm excited about those opportunities with social media, with even in fashion, like there's a lot of fashion weeks popping up, mm -hmm. like there's full figure fashion week, Atlantic city fashion week, Atlanta fashion week, where things were before so only certain people could get into these really big arenas and they just weren't attainable. A lot of things are becoming much more attainable and much more wide, much easier for people to be widely known, even with speaking engagements and podcasts like this, where you can really get your name out there and, and get somewhere from just starting from the bottom. So I think it's really a good thing. I think it's something that every business can benefit from. What advice would you give to someone that's just starting out in this field? Like, say 
there's someone listening and they want to be the next Akilah Tompkins Robinson, what, what advice would you give them? Don't be too afraid and don't think that other people aren't afraid. <laughs> so like, for example, with the speaking, just apply. The most they can do is say no. Or, you know, maybe next time I applied to a conference this, this summer, actually, and they said no, but they gave me 25% off. And so I'm going to go. Okay. <laughs> so that, that, that was nice, but you know, you, you do get a no. So the biggest thing is don't be afraid to apply. The next biggest thing would be find who you like to work with. Like I know I've talked a lot about getting that niche, which it's a good thing, but the adverse is it forces people or, or convinces people that they need to only work with this type of. You get your niche a lot of times from dealing with looking at exploring a bunch of different avenues, especially in design. You want to do a number of types of sites before you say this is the only site that I do. And just because I like one type of site and I like working with one type of client and business doesn't mean I don't do other type of sites. Like I've got a coaching client coming on just because I like her message. I like her message. I like what she's saying. She's stylish and fashionable enough for me, although she's not selling any clothes, you know, to me that that's going to work. I think my design style is definitely going to work with her because of the way she wants to brand her message. Sometimes you might get someone who's just branding to the same type of people that you're branding to. Well, you know them, and now you get to know this person so you can help them. Don't just tell yourself, well, oh, you're only this kind of business. I can only work with you. I see people do that all the time. They either do too much or do too little. So just kind of be in that in between. And like I said, don't be afraid for the no. Don't be afraid to put in that quote and see what people say. Don't be afraid to say that price and see what people say. Just go out there and do it. All they can do is say no. All right. So just to wrap things up, where can our audience find you online? Well, I have two sites. So I have my design site, which is AxMe Designs, A K Z M E Designs.com. And then I have my e commerce education training site, which is called Online Boutique Source.com. So those are the main two places where I hang out online. And I'm on Facebook and Twitter and Pinterest and LinkedIn. I'm on everything is AxMe Design. So you'll see me there a lot of places. All right, that sounds good. Akilah Tompkins Robinson, thank you again uh, for talking with our audience. I think this is this is a lot of good information, not just for people that are starting out, but for people that are thinking about how they want to get into e-commerce. I think a lot of the things that you mentioned will will give people the ammunition to really go to a designer or go to a developer and be able to tell them exactly what it is they're looking for realistically. So, so thanks a lot. I really appreciate it. No problem. Glad to help. And that's it for this week. Man, Akilah really dropped some business gems in that interview, huh? Big thanks again to our sponsors, MailChimp and Audible, Need Email Marketing. Stop copying and pasting addresses into Gmail and get you a free account today at MailChimp.com. And while you settle in this Memorial Day, unwind and relax with a good book. Head to AudibleTrial.com forward slash Revision Path and get a free audio book and a 30-day free trial. Revision Path is a 318 media project. If you like what we're doing with this and want to show your support, visit us at revisionpath.com forward slash donate and sponsor an upcoming episode or leave us a tip in our tip jar. Your donations help keep Revision Path going strong. Thanks for tuning in and we'll see you next time.